because I just uh, uh, just talk in um, uh, during my presentation, and then I'll be happy to stop. Right. So uh, when I said I was going to give a talk at uh, the MCV Church seminar, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. This was one option I was thinking about, but I was not completely convinced. Uh, working on a project with a bunch of students, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. And a month ago, when Walter gave his talk on orthogonal polynomial, uh, that convinced me to, to, to sort of follow up with uh, his talk. And, uh, talk about orthogonal polynomial in a completely different setting and the setting is going to be the setting of fractals so i'm going to come back to a precise definition of fractal uh, even though i'll be working mainly on one example which is uh, the sipensky uh, the sipensky gasket or the sipensky triangle uh, so this is a joint work that goes back to the original work was uh, with myself uh, and uh, uh, kathleen hood and uh, Bob Strecker. So Kathleen Hood was uh, an undergraduate student of mine at the University of Maryland. She's now on the faculty at Purdue University. And uh, Bob Strecker was my postdoc mentor. So we start this uh, looking at the orthogonal polynomial, or precisely uh, the legend of polynomial on the fractal a couple of years ago. And uh, last year, with uh, a new set of students, uh, Max Jiang, Tian Lan, and uh, Shashank Sule. Uh, Sriram Venkat and uh, Xiaoxin Wang. Uh, we start working on um, a different aspect of orthogonal polynomial and fractal, and uh, those are the so-called Sobolev uh, orthogonal polynomial. So I'm going to try to sort of uh, explain each of these terms uh, as we go along. All right, so the outline of the talk is that I want to sort of give you a framework of what I'm about to, to talk about. So I want to recall a few basic facts about orthogonal polynomial, um, especially on the interval negative one one. So I'm not going to worry about like a thing like um, uh, uh, Hermit polynomial or so forth. I want to focus on the case where the domain I'm working is, is a compact set, uh, the compact domain, which will be the case for the Sipensky triangle as we're going to see in a minute. So I'm going to focus essentially on two classes of uh, orthogonal polynomial or the interval negative one one, and which are the legend polynomial and uh, the Sobolev polynomial. The legend polynomial are quite well known and uh, quite, I mean, we, we know a lot about them from numerical analysis. Uh, they appear in many, many situations. Uh, the Sobolev orthogonal polynomial, even though they are quite old, um, they are not probably as well known, and uh, there have been sort of a recent like uh, resurgence of research around them. There have been like some very nice articles around them, like in, in the last few years. I'll point out some of them if anyone is interested in learning more about what I'll be talking about. But uh, section one of my talk <coughs> is essentially to put down like the framework of what I think about my wishing list, uh, my wish list, and. Uh, I'm trying to sort of see how I can extend all of this notion to the case where the underlying set is no longer um, uh, the unit interval or, the, or a compact interval, but uh, uh, a compact set in, uh, in, uh, in, in the plane. And more specifically, uh, a non-smooth compact set, as we're going to see, is going to be uh, the Sipensky triangle. So I'll uh, briefly remind or introduce to many of you what it means to do analysis on this kind of set. And uh, there's going to be a lot of parallel between analysis on graphs and what I'll be presenting. So you can think about this set as, uh, as uh, the limit of uh, graphs as you're taking more and more vertices in your graph. And uh, so to do the analysis, you're going to do spectral analysis on the graphs, and then you're going to try to scale it to, to infinity. And then I'll come to, to the last part of the talk. I'll uh, tell you what the uh, legend and the Sobolev orthogonal polynomial are going to be. Uh, the talk will not be technical. I'm not going to try to prove anything. I'm just going to present a few results. But uh, the, the main part is going to probably be to introduce the notion of analysis on factor, which is going to be in this section right here. All right. So I just want to sort of put things in perspective. Uh, this is probably not the classical way to define things, but since I want to focus exactly on the legend of orthogonal polynomial, uh, I just want to remind people uh, that uh, the one way to define the uh, legend of orthogonal polynomial is to do sort of uh, uh, use Gram Schmidt to make like uh, the monomial T to a power K uh, an orthogonal set. And once you do that, you get like this family that I'm going to call pi k, and uh, they are going to be monic, meaning that uh, leading, the coefficient of the leading term is going to always be plus one. 
and uh, you can write them in, in this form. And uh, the, they are going to be perpendicular in the sense that the inner product of any two distant one will be zero, and then the inner product of uh, the same will just give the, the norm square of, uh, of uh, that polynomial. Uh, there are a few things that you can sort of uh, set down. So if I put pi minus one to be zero, and uh, pi zero obviously is going to be one, then one of the characteristic of orthogonal polynomial is the so-called free term recursion formula, which is given in this form. And uh, a nice way of, for me to think about it is that if I take t multiplied by uh, pi k of t, uh, that's a polynomial of degree k plus one. So what you're doing is to expand that polynomial into the orthogonal basis and writing it in this form gives you the so-called uh, free term recursion formula. And this is one of the characteristics of orthogonal polynomial. Sorry, Mr. Uh, we can't seem to see you. Your slides changing. Um, Do you see it now? Your slides. Is it moving? Um, no, they are. We still have the. No, it's not moving. Uh, hold on. Can you see? Yes, it's it's moving now. It's moving now. Okay, let me go back and then hopefully it's going to work. Is it moving now? Is it moving? Um, it's it's a dark screen actually. We see a blank screen. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I had this with Zoom last time. Let me probably try to open it in preview and then I'm going to share the preview. Is it moving now? Um, yes, 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 it's moving. Can you move? Yes, no, we're going to see what's. Is it moving? No. Uh, what are you saying? Just the integral, um, the theorem uh, of uh, the Lagrange We are at page four. We got stuck at page four. You can see page four? Yes. Page four. Yes, only, only page four. Correct. Can you see page three now? No. From my side, I guess I got page four. Um, what do I need to do? Yeah. Um, maybe let me stop and then start over with sharing quickly. Yes. Is it changing? Yeah, yeah. Now I can see it. Yeah. Yes, it's changing now. Yeah. Yes. So this is the first page. Is yeah, that correct? correct? Yeah, correct. correct. Yeah. And then it moved to the outline. Yes. Yeah. And then legend orthogonal polynomial. Yeah. It's yes. Now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, so this is just like uh, defining the legend orthogonal polynomial. Uh, I was pointing out the three-term recursion formula that's uh, at the bottom right here. Uh, 
one of the interesting things about like orthogonal polynomial is that you can get them like uh, from an approximation point of view. So if you let Pn uh, be, uh, can you see this slide like uh, theorem least square? Yes, 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 I can see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So when you let like a Pn be the space of polynomial of degree at most n, and uh, you want to find like um, the approximation of an L2 function with this norm, uh, those, those the polynomial of degree at most n that's closest to f, then you can easily sort of uh, realize that uh, to get it, all you have to do is to take your polynomial, uh, your function, and to project it into the orthonormal uh, legend uh, polynomial. And uh, this is uh, something very, very classical and very easy to, to derive. So if instead uh, you ask the same question, but rather than sort of looking at just a function, you also want to sort of uh, not only approximate the function, but uh, let's say one of its derivatives, then you can set up the same problem and ask uh, what polynomial will uh, be close to a function in the Sobolev space H1, uh, polynomial of degree at most n. And I believe the first person to sort of uh, at least to write about this problem is DC Lewis uh, in 1947. And that where he did not introduce the notion of a term of Sobolev orthogonal polynomial, but in his uh, solution to this, he essentially sort of derived what's known today as a Sobolev orthogonal polynomial. So you can view the Sobolev orthogonal polynomial as uh, applying the gram schmidt uh, process again onto the monomial, but you change the inner product. Instead of using the L2 inner product, you use the inner product of the Sobolev H1 norm, which is uh, you look at the inner product between the function and, uh, I mean, the, between the two functions, but as well as the product between the, uh, the derivative of the functions. And uh, you can actually do something a lot more general where you, you take like a bunch of uh, a Borel measure, uh, lambda k, and uh, you define an inner product in this form, and uh, you can ask exactly what are the orthogonal polynomial with respect to this, uh, this general inner product. So most of the initial work on this has been done on this particular uh, example, where you take essentially the Lebesgue measure on zero one, and then you take a multiple of the Lebesgue measure. And uh, there are many interesting things that, uh, that resulted from this uh, specific inner product. Uh, one of the bad thing is that uh, you no longer have access to something like uh, the free term recursion formula. And uh, this is essentially due to the fact that uh, uh, integration by part somehow sort of uh, doesn't work with this, uh, with this inner product. But uh, there are some interesting things um, that, uh, yep. Can I, uh, I think you need to reshare. Somebody interrupted your share. Can you reshare again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So just hit the present now at the, at the bottom to see. And yeah, the audience, let's just be careful about hitting the present route. This would interrupt anybody presenting. Okay, we are back. All right, sorry about that. So we're good now? It wasn't your fault, yes. Okay. And so uh, in this particular case, you no longer have access to the free term recursion formula, but we have some other interesting property. So the, the Sobolev or so orthogonal polynomial, I'm going to denote them S. Um, and then the lambda denote the parameter, the extra new parameter that I sort of am using in this particular case. So the, the, the family will depend on not only the, the degree of the polynomial, but also on this parameter lambda. And they satisfy a sort of differential equation that involves the Legendre orthogonal polynomial. And they satisfy a difference equation also in terms of uh, the Legendre orthogonal polynomial. So these are pretty classical results. They are results about the asymptotic of this coefficient as a function of lambda when uh, some of them depend on lambda. But in most cases, uh, this, uh, this coefficient are actually uh, independent of lambda. So just a brief history of this, uh, uh, this class of uh, orthogonal polynomial. Uh, I think of uh, the first person to actually uh, you know, formally name this uh, Sobolev legend orthogonal polynomial was uh, Althammer in 1962. And uh, there is a very nice exposition by uh, Marcelin and Sue, uh, and Marcelin and uh, Moreno Balza 
if you really want to sort of read anything about uh, about this orthogonal polynomial, they are very fascinating. Uh, you can check out these two articles. They are very, very good and uh, easy to sort of uh, get into the topic. So this is essentially the framework that I'm looking at. I want to define essentially the equivalent of these two uh, classes of orthogonal polynomial on a set where the set is not smooth itself. And the set that I'm going to be looking at is going to be a fractal. And your first question for me will probably be what's a fractal. And the best answer that I know for this question is that uh, I know one uh, when I see one. So I don't think there is a, a universal definition of fractal. One thing that I do sort of see that most of fractal have in common is that they are self-similar set. So I'm going to convince you that the unit interval is also a fractal, even though, I mean, we never think about it in that, in that case. So this slide is sort of supposed to be just um, a sort of motivation to the next definition that I want to sort of look at. So the unit interval uh, 0, 01, uh, I can view it as a, as a union of two pieces. And the pieces are made out of these two functions. So the function fi is 1 half x minus qi plus qi. So what are these two functions? This is just like uh, um, uh, a contraction of ratio 1 half. The first one is going to fix 0, and then the second one is going to fix 1. So f0 will just fix 0, and f2, uh, f1, sorry, f0 will fix 0, and then f1 will fix 1. When you apply f0 to the whole length interval, you get the first half here, and then when you apply f1, you get the second half. And the interval uh, 0, 1 is just a union of these two pieces. Now, uh, this is something called, uh, the, uh, it's of a fixed point of uh, an iterated function system. So you can think about this fi as an iterated function system. And they are defined for a contraction of a given ratio that fits a certain number of points in the plane. And uh, the set that sort of satisfies this equation is usually called the attractor of this, uh, of this uh, iterated function system. Now, for the unit interval, I didn't, know, I didn't need to sort of go through this to sort of convince you that this is on, uh, something straightforward to see. However, uh, there is another way to look at the unit interval that's going to be very appealing to me, which is I want to look at the limit of the unit interval as a limit of graphs. And uh, I'm drawing the graph and uh, as well as the unit interval here. So this picture sort of convey many sort of uh, meaning. So what I call gamma zero is a graph with two vertices, these two, and combined by this or joined by this edge. And then gamma one is a refinement of gamma zero, where I sort of take like uh, the midpoint between these two points. So I add one extra vertex, and then I still get my graph to sort of be connected. And then gamma two is what I get by sort of repeating the process one more time. I take the half of the left uh, inter half interval, and then the half of the right interval, I get two new vertices, and then I keep joining them. And then I keep doing this, and then I'm going to sort of get in the limit the unit interval. Now, if you look at it carefully, what I'm just doing is just to sort of pick out like uh, 0, 1, 0, 1 half, z, uh, 1, uh, 0, 1 quarter, 1 half, 3 quarter, 1. What are those numbers? Those are just the dyadic numbers in the interval 0, 1. So when you take the collection of all dyadic number in the interval 0, 1, and then you take the closure of that set, you know that this set is dense in the interval 0, 1. So in other words, if you give me a function that's continuous, all I have to tell you is uh, the behavior of those, that function on the discrete set, which is a union of all these vertices. In other words, the collection of all these dyadic points is why I need to sort of do any analysis as far as continuous function is concerned. Because if I can describe a function on all the dyadic points, then I completely know the function on the entire unit interval. So this is the approach that I would like to take in order to talk about analysis on graphs. Uh, and in particular on the C oh, sorry, on fractal, and in particular the fractal that I want to sort of keep an eye on is going to be the Sipensky gasket. So what are the main thing that uh, that we sort of discover here? First, uh, the fractal that I'm going to be looking at will be like uh, uh, the attractor of an iterated function system. So that's given by this equation right here. The second thing that I sort of uh, um, is that, yep. Can I ask a question? Sorry for interruption. Yep. So. That's fine. So this M, this is like the number of uh, diagonal points you have in the set. What do you say as to say that? Say it or again. The M you have, like, uh, this, does this yes. denote the number of diagonal points you would have in the splitting method you are using? Exactly. So uh, no, the M will be the, the number, number of approximation. 
Okay. So at level zero, I only have two points, right? At okay. level one, I'm going to have three points. At level two, I'm going to, so the M denote the level of approximation. So if I'm thinking about approximating the unit interval with graph, then the graph gamma M is the nth approximation of my, of my set. And then the mm -hmm. number of vertices in that is going to be exactly two to the power M plus one. I see, okay. Are you interested in, uh, for instance, if you were to approximate a function on the sets, subsets of this interval, uh, are you worried about how much M, how large M should be, or you're not interested in these kinds of questions? That, that, that will be like, yes, if you want to sort of do a final analysis, that will be what, okay. what you want to do. So in, in effect, uh, I'm going to sort of try to, and I'll think about it the other way around. I'll try to define okay. a function full on each of these level M's, and then I'm going to keep M getting larger and larger. So if you want to do approximation, that will be the question, what's the level of approximation that you want to tolerate? And then based on that, you're going to sort of take the graph level that you want to use, and then you're going to do your analysis on that, on, uh, at that level. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, all right, so uh, a few things, graph approximation, uh, iterated function system has an attractor, unit interval is uh, the attractor for this particular set of two iterated functions. And uh, the fact that the data points are dense in the unit interval is something also that I'm going to sort of try to exploit. All right, so from here, what do I do? Uh, I think about the unit interval as a limit of graph. I can actually sort of uh, show you that the second derivative operator you can view it as a weighted limit of, uh, oh, sorry, a limit of weighted uh, Laplacian on, uh, on, on, the, on this graph that I just defined. So let's go back and uh, let's sort of uh, see quickly. So if I'm sitting at a point here, if I want to define, like say the second difference operator, then I know how to define it. I, I, I have one step here, one step here, and then I'm going to sort of say that I have two neighbors, so I have to take out twice the value at that point. And that's what the Laplacian on each of these graphs will be. And if you scale the Laplacian correctly, you can show that as M goes to infinity, the limit of this uh, scale version of the graph Laplacian is going to give you exactly the second derivative on the unit interval zero one. And the beauty of this whole thing is that you can actually prove that uh, the, La the spectrum of the Laplacian over in other words, the eigenvalue and the eigenvector of this Laplacian are completely determined by the eigenvector and the eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian. Now, we all know what are the eigenvalues and the eigenvector of uh, the second derivative of operator on the interval zero one. These are just like cosine n pi, sorry, cosine nx and sine nx. And uh, the eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue are going to be n square, uh, the square of the, I might have sort of forgotten about the pi there, but uh, that is essentially what you sort of have here. So it turns out that you can get all of those by actually just doing like a, some sort of matrix analysis. You can sort of write down the matrix corresponding to this graph, uh, Laplacian, compute the spectrum, and uh, if you take the proper sort of uh, rescaling of uh, this uh, eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector, then you can sort of prove that they converge exactly as M goes to infinity to the cosine and sine, as well as the corresponding eigenvalue of uh, the second derivative operator on zero one. So in other words, I can completely rebuild the theory of Fourier analysis, just starting from this graph and uh, this graph approximation of a unit interval. And this is a key idea that I want to sort of take and sort of project into a different setting. And the setting is what I'm going to sort of show now, the setting of factor. So I'm going to sort of uh, do this on a slide, but I'll show a picture in the, on the next slide. So here I'm going to fix three points. Uh, the first point will be zero, zero. The other one will be one over two, square root of three over two. And the last one will be one, zero. And then I'm going to take a three, uh, three contraction. They're all going to have ratio one half. Each of them will fix one of these three points. And, uh, and uh, the Sipensky triangle or the Sipensky gasket is a unique non-empty compact subset of R2 that satisfies this equation. You can show that there is only one set that's going to sort of satisfy this. And that's named, uh, that's called the Sipensky triangle or the Sipensky gasket. So as a picture, this is a picture of a Sipensky uh, gasket. This is a point that I call Q0, this is Q1, this is Q2. 
and they'll see what I'm doing. I'm taking like a this uh, contraction of ratio one half that fix each of these three points. So when I apply F0, it sort of shrink the triangle to this top part. When I apply F1, it shrink it to this part. When I apply F2, it shrink it to this part. So the way to think about it is almost like the same principle that you do constructing the, uh, constructing the counter set. Uh, you, you cut the triangle in four parts and then you remove the part that's somehow upside down. And so when I remove this part, I have this three part left. And then I'll do the same thing at this level. I'll remove this, I'll remove this, I'll remove that, and then I'll keep on doing this. When I do this all the way to infinity, the set that I'm going to get is going to be exactly the Sipensky gasket. Now, I don't think this gives you an idea clearly of what a sort of particular point or a generic point will be in the Sipensky gasket. And that way it will sort of be handy to go back to the fact that you can view the unit interval as a limit of graphs. And so here I want to sort of explain how you can view the Sipensky triangle as a limit of graphs. So the very first graph will be the graph with three vertices, and the vertices will be just a three point initial point that I give you. And then I'm going to be adding three points at every level. So I'm going to apply the, the, the map uh, the map FI to all these three points. And then I'm going to get like a, a graph of six points. And then I'm going to keep on doing this every uh, at every level. And then the collection of all the vertices in my graph, I'm going to denote it like a V star. And it turns out that when you take the closure of that set, you get exactly the Sipensky gasket. So the point that are sort of uh, generated by applying this map over and over to the point Q1, Q0, and Q2, those points are exactly the equivalent of a dyadic number in the interval 0, 1. They form a dense subset of uh, the Sipensky triangle. So in picture, this is what I have here. So the first approximation of a zero level approximation is just a graph with uh, three vertices, with three corners, and then uh, three edge. The next approximation, I'm going to sort of uh, add three more points that are the result of applying the map to each of these. And uh, I get like uh, a set of few new vertices. And then I'm going to go, so this is V1. So I do it five times, this is what I'm going to get. And then if I do it 10 times, this is what you're going to get. So you can sort of see that, I mean, uh, doing this like uh, a couple of times already giving you something that's sort of uh, going to sort of look almost like continuous is no longer like a discrete set. And uh, this is uh, the way I'm going to think about uh, uh, the Sipensky triangle. It's going to be a limit of graphs and the graph are the one that I just sort of described over here. So at this point, I just want to sort of make sure that we all together just want to pause a little bit and I'll see if there is any question. So if you don't get anything out of a talk, one thing that I'm hoping you get is that uh, this is actually a very nice way to sort of look at the unit interval and the Sipensky gasket exactly in a parallel form and to view the Sipensky gasket as almost like as a construction that sort of can sort of be generated through point that behave almost exactly as uh, the dyadic number in the interval zero one. All right, so the next thing that I would like to do is uh, I want to do Fourier analysis here. And uh, that's what I was trying to do. I, I work in harmonic analysis. So my first thought or my first instinct is to sort of build things that are going to behave like cosine and sine wave on this uh, on the Sipensky triangle. So I'm going to sort of do that by defining a graph Laplacian. So the graph Laplacian at a given point, so if you see it on, a, on, a, on one of the graph, so let's go back to a picture. I'm looking at V1 right here. So if you sit at this point right here, you can count how many, uh, how many neighbors it has. So it has exactly four neighbors. You can sort of see. And this is independent of which level you're picking. Like any point that you pick, except this three point that are somehow like exceptional. And we view them as a boundary of our graph. If you pick any other point on the graph, they all have exactly four neighbors. So if I want to define like uh, the Laplacian, I'm going to define it as a sum of the value of a function over all the neighbors. They are exactly four neighbors. And then I'm taking out minus four times the value at the point. And that's what I'm going to call the graph Laplacian here. And uh, there is a lot of work to do, but uh, it turns out that you need to scale this graph Laplacian by five to a power m in order to sort of ensure that when you take the limit as m goes to infinity, you get an operator that's going to be well-behaved and defined on the entire Sipensky gasket. 
I'm not going to go into into this part right here, five to a power m, but uh, you can actually sort of uh, show why this has to be the case. It has to do with the host of dimension of uh, the of the fractal that you're using, and uh, that's sort of uh, what's underlined here. But I'm just going to sort of put that under the rug, and uh, somehow like uh, convince you that if you scale the graph Laplacian by this power five to a power m, and you take the limit as m goes to infinity, you get to get you're going to get an operator that I'm going to call the Laplacian on the Sikansky gasket. This is going to be the analog of a second derivative operator on the unit interval. So this is the operator that I'm interested in. This is the operator on which I want to use, uh, I want to do Fourier analysis. I would like to understand the, the eigenvalue, the eigenvector of this operator, and I want to sort of understand them. But my hope is to be able to build all of those using just like a thing about like uh, the finite approximation. At the end of the day, this is just like a matrix, and I know how to find the eigenvalue and the eigenvector of a matrix. And I'm hoping that if I scale this eigenvalue and eigenvector correctly, then I'm going to be able to get the complete spectrum of this Laplacian. I'm not going to go into all those details, but it turns out that all this thing is true. Uh, one more thing that I want to sort of uh, mention is that uh, there's a notion of energy, which sort of somehow like corresponds to what you'll think of as uh, uh, the Laplacian, uh, you can think about it as somehow like uh, write it in terms of the de derivative of a function. And so uh, that's something I don't want to sort of go too much into because we don't, we will not sort of need this energy functional too much in, in, in this talk. Uh, the main thing that I want to sort of uh, mention is that uh, uh, there is a miracle that just happened. You can show that uh, this Laplacian, or if you take minus uh, delta, which will be uh, 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 positive semi-definite, you can prove that it has like uh, a basis of uh, eigenfunction that I'm going to denote VK, and uh, the corresponding eigenvalue are all going to be non-negative, they are going to be lambda K, and they're all going to sort of be uh, order in a non-decreasing fashion, and the only accumulation point will be plus infinity. So in particular, if you give me any function on L2 of a Sipinski gasket, I can expand the function into a Fourier series in this form. So you in a product phi k multiplied by phi k. All right, so this is a big jump. I didn't sort of tell you how I get this eigen function, but uh, it turned out that you can sort of forget them completely from the discrete uh, discrete spectrum of this, uh, this graph Laplacian. Uh, that's uh, for another talk, and uh, I can sort of uh, talk a little bit about it at the end of the talk if there's any question. Uh, the other thing that's important for me to real to notice here is that if you want to solve an equation of a form minus Laplacian u uh, is equal to f uh, with uh, boundary condition equal to zero, this is somehow like a Poisson equation, then you can write like uh, the solution exactly in terms of a green function, and the green function is given in terms of the eigen function and the eigenvalue in this form. This green function will be very important for me uh, when I sort of uh, move to, to the polynomial. So I want you to sort of keep this in mind as well. All right, so there is a notion of a derivative or tangential derivative and uh, normal derivative at uh, some point on uh, the Sipinski gasket, especially at uh, the end point. Uh, I'm going to mention them, but I'm not going to sort of use them too much. What I want to mention them to do is uh, to sort of show you that I have some equivalent of uh, ghost green formula that we all know from uh, our calculus in many variables. So the green ghost formula is true and you can write it in this form in terms of, uh, in this case, it's going to just involve a normal derivative uh, of, a, of a function. Uh, now, this is the main thing. So I want now to define a polynomial. So for me, a polynomial on the Sipinski gasket, uh, if I fix the degree j to be like a non-negative integer, a polynomial of degree less or equal to j is any solution of Laplacian to a power j plus one is equal to zero. Um, uh, if j is equal to zero, Laplacian u is equal to zero, that's an harmonic function. If you're on the unit interval and you look at the uh, 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 second derivative of a function is equal to zero, it tells you that the function is a linear function and the linear function is just an harmonic function in, in this setting. So this is a normal, I mean, a very analogous way to actually define what a polynomial is. A polynomial is just going to be a solution to a j plus one Laplacian is equal to zero. And that's what I'm going to define as a polynomial. So if we all agree that even in the classical case, this is of the right definition, 
then we gave ourselves here like the mental that we're going to try to build on. We have a set, we have a derivative on the set, we can solve this kind of equation. And the solution to this particular equation, when I face J, will just give me like uh, the set of polynomial of degree less or equal to J. I'm going to denote that set HRJ, and I can show that it's a linear space of dimension three multiplied by J plus one. And I can sort of define a basis for this uh, for this formula right here. So the basis will sort of uh, depend on where, which point I'm sitting at. I have a three boundary point. And uh, it's almost as uh, if I'm sort of asking you to sort of define polynomial on zero one. And I ask you, let's say, I want uh, the value at zero to be zero and the derivative at zero to be zero. And then I go to one and then I have the value at one to be one and then the derivative at one to be one. So this is a kind of thing that I'm doing for these spaces. So I can prove that these spaces exist and, uh, and uh, that's going to give me the notion of polynomial of degree J. Okay, this slide cut a little bit short. So what I want to do here is to sort of, uh, uh, I think I'll sort of, uh, I'll come back to, to what I was about to, to say on that slide that you can see there is something, a remark here that I'm going to sort of need in a minute, but uh, I'll come to that in a minute. So uh, the next thing I want to sort of uh, mention is that there is another basis uh, on this set of polynomial that I like a little bit better. And that's going to look like uh, the monomial S to a power J divided by factorial J. So what is so nice about S to a power J over factorial J? It's, uh, so if I look at the function S to a power J over factorial J, and I look at the derivative of any value, uh, let's say the k derivative of this function, and I evaluated that as zero, all of them are going to be zero at zero, except the, k, the j derivative is going to be exactly one at zero. And this polynomial or this basis is exactly a basis of that type. At each of the, end, uh, each of the boundary point, I'm going to require the very last derivative to sort of evaluate to one at that point and then zero everywhere else. And then I can do it for each of the points. So that's why I'm going to sort of uh, have three different parameters to denote this monomial the n will be the vertex with respect to which I'm sort of uh, evaluating it. The j will be the degree of the polynomial and the i will be the kind of polynomial that I'm looking at. So here I'm going to sort of think about some of them will be like uh, symmetric and some of, the, of them will be anti-symmetric and the i parameter will sort of uh, denote that. So uh, it's not going to be too important to sort of uh, look at uh, this. I want to give this talk at a high level, but uh, the point is this, three family together will form a different basis of a monomial. And those bases are going to be the one that are going to look almost like S to a power J divided by factorial J. Uh, when I look at the N equals zero family, I'm going to, to remove the, the, the subscript zero, and then I'm just going to denote them PJI. So for the remaining of the talk, when you see PJI, just think about like uh, that of uh, the fact that I'm facing the vertex to be zero. That way I'm evaluating all my polynomial and then looking at everything from that point. So if I said to be symmetric, I'll be symmetric with respect to the line that goes through that point and goes through the midpoint of the of the opposite uh, basis. All right, so uh, the nice thing about this monomial is that if I take with one derivative, then I'm going to, uh, or Laplacian applied to this will sort of exactly kill uh, or decrease like of a degree of a polynomial by exactly one. And uh, for i equal one or two of a monomial PNJI will be symmetric. They're going to be the analog of two to a power k, uh, t to a power two k. And then when i is equal to three, uh, they are going to be anti-symmetric. They're going to sort of be analog of uh, t to a power two k plus one. And all I'm just trying to say is that all those monomials that I just described are somehow like uh, the analog of x to a power j divided by factorial j. All right, so, so far I've been telling you things that sort of look very nice. It seems to sort of be a perfect analogy, uh, but there are some things that sort of are not too nice and that's going to sort of create some challenge. So the very first one is that uh, uh, you can sort of show that uh, the set of polynomial is not, or uh, the, the domain of the Laplacian is not an algebra in the sense that here, multiplication is not an operation that allows. You cannot multiply together two polynomials and expect to get two polynomials. 
the fact is that the domain of the Laplacian, if you take u to be in the domain of the Laplacian, v to be in the domain of the Laplacian, then u multiplied by v will not be in the domain of the Laplacian. So you might not even be able to sort of take like uh, the, uh, the, the Laplacian of the product of the two, let alone conclude that this is going to be equal to zero. So for instance, things like Leibniz rule will not sort of apply here. Uh, I can sort of show that if you take any non-constant function in the domain of the Laplacian, then the square of that function is not even in the domain of the Laplacian. So there are many things that we are used to in analysis that are no longer true and that are going to create the challenge here. So for instance, how do you sort of define X multiplied by P of X? If P is a polynomial of degree N in the classical case, I know that when I multiply by X, I get a polynomial of degree N plus one. We cannot do this anymore in this particular case. So the way we're going to increase the degree of a polynomial in our case, we know how to decrease a degree of a polynomial. We just have to apply the Laplacian to it. So to increase the degree of a polynomial, we're going to apply the inverse of the Laplacian, which is a green operator. And so if I have a polynomial P of degree J, then to get a, a polynomial of degree J plus one, I'm just going to take the integral of the polynomial against the green function, and that's going to give me a polynomial of degree J plus one. So this is going to be the analog of multiplication for me. If I want to multiply, I'm going to keep applying the green operator a few more times, like uh, as many times as I like, in order to increase the degree of a polynomial to the, to the degree that I want to achieve. So that's one main difference that I want you to sort of keep in mind. The other one is that the analog of the wire star approximation theorem that says that you can approximate like uh, a continuous function on zero one using like polynomial. This is no longer true. So you, uh, the set of polynomial is not a complete set in the Sipersky triangle if you take L2 of uh, SG here. So you can find things that are non-zero that are perpendicular to all polynomial on the Sipersky gasket. And that's something that we have to also keep in mind here. So this is a, a very short introduction to what I'll call analysis on factors. So now I have about 10 minutes to talk about like um, orthogonal polynomial here. So we know what a polynomial is by now. And uh, to have an orthogonal polynomial, all we have to do is to apply a uh, gram schmidt to like a set of monomial. And then we're going to try to understand what are the property of those, those polynomials. So for this particular one, I just want to sort of uh, show you one, one kind of example. So uh, if you remember, I said if I fix the vertex to be Q0 and I look at the family of monomials that correspond to that vertex, then I'm going to take away the uh, subscript of zero and I'm going to call them PJI. The I will sort of tell me whether or not I'm dealing with a symmetric or non-symmetric polynomial and the J will be the degree of a polynomial. So here I'm going to fix what one of a kind and then I'm going to look at uh, the orthogonal system that uh, is obtained by applying gram schmidt to this family. I have an inner product on this in this setting. So I can do gram schmidt and I'm going to call the resulting like a set of polynomial QJ and they're going to sort of be the equivalent of the Legend polynomial for me, of the Legend orthogonal polynomial in this uh, factored setting. Uh, there is uh, an underlying assumption here. There is an I that's here that I sort of uh, take away so that uh, we don't have too many sort of uh, index. But uh, again, everything depends on uh, the kind of uh, family that you're going to sort of start dealing with. So one of the things that you can actually prove is that you have like um, a three-term recursion formula. Uh, and uh, you could sort of see there is a slight difference here. The three-term recursion formula, the classical one, uh, will tell you if you remember correctly. So let's go back to, to the beginning, just to sort of make sure that we... So the three-term recursion formula tell you that if I take T minus alpha K is a coefficient that you can find, multiplied by one of the polynomial, then you can write the polynomial of degree K plus one in terms of this one. And the way I like to think about it is to sort of say that just take T multiplied by pi K, that become a polynomial of degree K plus one, and try to expand this into your orthonormal basis. Then you can write it in terms of k plus one, k, and only k minus one. All the other term will be exactly equal to zero. Now, remember, multiplication is not an allowed operation on the fractal. So what replaces multiplication is going to take like the green operator and apply to the polynomial. And then you get a polynomial of degree one degree higher. And so if you do that, that's how you sort of get this a free term recursion formula because this expression fk plus one here is exactly the green function applied to your polynomial 
of degree k, you get something of degree k plus one, k plus one, and then when you expand it, you can prove that it only has like a free term. It you can expand it exactly in terms of k plus one, k and k minus one. Uh, I can describe exactly uh, how the coefficient b k and c k behave, and uh, and uh, and uh, I know a lot of things about this polynomial. Uh, I'll show you some picture in a minute. So some results that I want to highlight here, uh, you can look at the asymptotic analysis of the coefficient in the free term recursion formula. Uh, you can sort of prove like uh, the equivalent of the christoffel darbu formula in this setting. Uh, you can analyze uh, the corresponding three diagonal Jacobi matrices, and you can do some uh, investigation of a nodal set of this uh, orthogonal polynomial. So by nodal set here, I mean the set of zero of this orthogonal polynomial. This is something very tricky that we just sort of uh, scratch the surface off and uh, we haven't sort of delved a lot into, into this. So here are some pictures of this polynomial. So just to sort of give you a way we construct this picture. So we put like the Sipinski triangle in a three dimension and then the height of, of, of the value of the function at each point of the Sipinski gasket is uh, given by the height. And so we sort of show the shape of the polynomial using like the Sipinski gasket. So Q0, this polynomial are all anti-symmetric. You can sort of clearly say that all symmetric, uh, anti-symmetric respect to the line that goes through zero and, uh, or Q0, sorry, and uh, the midpoint between Q1 and Q2. And as you increase the degree of the polynomial, you sort of start seeing uh, things that sort of, um, um, the, the, the behavior uh, is about the same. Uh, these pictures are quite sort of precise. We use like a very precise like uh, numerical computation. Um, to sort of highlight uh, some of the resemblance of this polynomial with the classical case, I'm trying to show you some of the restriction. So this is a restriction on the on the x-axis. So I restrict this to the bottom edge, and you can see that the q0, uh, the q1, the q2 all behave like uh, a polynomial of uh, order of uh, odd order. And um, uh, we use this to sort of count the number of zero and to sort of make some speculation about like uh, the nodal set of this this polynomial. Uh, these are examples of symmetric polynomial. Um, they seem to be symmetric, and um, we, we've done a few more things with them. So these are the restrictions. Um, there are a few more things I could sort of go on to sort of say, but I want to sort of keep it at uh, sort of a general high level. And uh, one thing that I would like to sort of maybe close with is uh, to look at the Sobolev legend polynomial and uh, a different inner product. So this is going to be the inner product where not only I look at the inner product of the function with uh, f and g, but I look at the inner product between the derivative. And here, remember, for me, the derivative of the function is exactly the Laplacian of the derivative. So I can sort of try to see what sort of polynomial I get when I do gram schmidt on the monomial. And uh, in this particular case, I have an extra factor, which is a lambda. That's a parameter that I can play with. And uh, in this case, there are many things that sort of uh, one can do. Um, you can sort of have like uh, a free term recursion formula, or even though this is sort of, uh, I'm not going to call it free term recursion formula because it does not really exist. If you see clearly here, what I'm doing is I'm taking the legend polynomial that I just constructed and I'm applying the uh, green operator to it. So I'm increasing the degree of the legend polynomial by one. And I'm trying to expand that in the new basis that I just constructed. And that's what I call the free term recursion formula. So in other words, the free term recursion formula does not exist in this setting as well. Uh, the only reason we need this is uh, this allows us to use what we've done before in order to easily uh, implement some of the numeric scheme that we have in order to display the function. So by this manner, we didn't have to sort of do too much in order to get this new Sobolev orthogonal polynomial. We can just use the construction that we already know about the legend one in order to sort of get the graph of this on the Sipinski triangle. And I'm going to show some of the graph in a minute. Uh, but there are some other resemblance between the classical case. So uh, there is uh, a second order differential equation that involves this uh, orthogonal polynomial, the Sobolev one, and that relates them to the legend orthogonal polynomial and is given in this in this term. Uh, again, most of the coefficients that appear, or all of the coefficients that appear in this equation, we can compute them pretty much uh, explicitly, and uh, we have like a pretty interesting analysis of the of asymptotic as n goes to infinity. 
And a very interesting thing that sort of happened is that, and this is different from the classical case, uh, as lambda goes to infinity, then this orthogonal polynomial, the sub-level orthogonal polynomial, converges to the legend orthogonal polynomial. But this is not legend, right? It's just like legend, but you take the legend of degree n minus 1, and then you apply the green operator to it. So these fn are not orthogonal themselves, even though you can prove that many of the inner product between fn and fk are going to be zero for very, very uh, large class of, uh, of, uh, of n dash n and k. And uh, just to sort of close to show some of the pictures. So uh, first thing that I want you to see, uh, these two last picture here, there's too much noise here. So the data for S17 and F16 is not very reliable. So this is something I'm not sort of, uh, we're still trying to sort of perfect a little bit. But uh, uh, S12 is already like uh, pretty good. We're pretty confident about the computation at this level. And uh, the polynomial seem to sort of have sort of some, I mean, intricate picture. Um, as far as the asymptotic with respect to lambda, uh, I fix uh, N. So I'm looking at a degree three, so level orthogonal polynomial. And I start letting lambda to be large. So here, lambda is equal to 100. Lambda is equal to 1,000, 10,000. And here, I sketch a graph of F3. And then you can sort of see clearly that we're sort of uh, getting closer and closer to, to this last shape right here. So a few more things that we're looking at. Um, uh, we focus on uh, the k equal to 1 family. There are many things that are different in this case. Um, interesting problem came about in, in this particular uh, situation. Uh, there are some interesting applications that we are looking at in terms of uh, quadrature rule and interpolation of function on the Sipensky gasket. And uh, the, the investigation of a zero set of this polynomial seems to sort of be something very interesting and uh, very fun to sort of try. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to sort of leave with uh, the reference. So there is a very interesting book by uh, Bob Strickas. It's called Differential Equation on Fractal. And this can give you a very, very nice overview of, uh, of, uh, of what I just talked about in terms of analysis on the Sipensky gasket. And if you want to learn a lot more about analysis on fractal, uh, a book by Jun Kigami, Analysis on Fractal, will sort of give you a more a broader perspective, uh, not just the Sipensky triangle, not just like what I talk about here, but sort of uh, harmonic analysis on fractal. And uh, the article with uh, Strickas and Toule uh, that we wrote earlier appeared in Constructive Approximation a couple of years ago. And uh, we're working right now on uh, a paper. Hopefully, by the end of this month, we should sort of have it on the archive. And if you want to learn about Sobolev orthogonal polynomial, this is a very, very nice survey paper uh, by Marcelin and uh, Sue. And I think that's all I have to tell you today. Uh, I think I rush a little bit toward the end, but I was trying to sort of make sure that I don't go over time. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take any question you may have. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we're clapping from where we are. Good. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. And let's see who has any questions or comments to make. Yeah, actually, can you hear me? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Yeah, so uh, my question I would say is more uh, related to curiosity. So they, to develop the motivation behind this uh, theory of uh, operator orthogonal uh, polynomials on fractal, is it purely mathematics or there is anything else behind that you're trying to, to, to find out? Uh, OK. so. Uh, there are some physical uh, motivation which I did not sort of bring about. In fact, I believe like the very first article of the very first like investigation on analysis on uh, this type of set was in the physics literature and uh, has to do with uh, solving some nonlinear Schrodinger equation and the way the underlying set is not like uh, is not like uh, a smooth set but a fractal set. And I think that was the original like uh, place where many of the things that sort of came to be known as analysis on Sipensky gasket sort of uh, first appear. So there is somehow like uh, a physical background to, to all of this. But what I presented here is just like uh, after this was uh, done, I think it sort of went unnoticed for many years. 
until like uh, a group of people, Junkigami was one of them, sort of start putting this into a broader perspective and people start looking at this from more a pure mathematical point of view. But uh, I think the main interest in uh, looking at uh, this uh, uh, can be traced back to the work of people like Jean Belissa, uh, Toulouse and uh, Ramal, Rama, I believe, who were working in the late 70s on a physical model that looked like uh, the, uh, the Sipensky gasket. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. So uh, one last thing. In your talk, you focus mainly on uh, uh, Laplacian uh, operator. So this choice, uh, is it purely because somehow maybe easier to replicate most of the results that we know in classical uh, uh, analysis, or we can also do the same thing by choosing, uh, by defining a different operator on uh, uh, Sierpensky uh, gasket? Uh, uh, I think uh, I think the Laplacian is somehow like a, such a, a, an important operator in analysis in general that mm -hmm. that uh, it sort of seemed natural to sort of start here and uh, I can define the Laplacian and any function of the Laplacian will sort of uh, go through exactly the type of analysis that I'm thinking of here. Uh, but uh, in terms of over operator, I'm not sure I know in general how to define over operator. There are many tools that might not sort of be at your disposal to do that. So many of the over operator that I can think of are still sort of Laplacian based. Uh, you can okay. define them as a function of a Laplacian. Okay, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Mustafa. Um, yes, Mama. Yes, 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 Mama. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Prof, for this uh, nice talk. Unfortunately, I joined after the first 10 minutes. I was stuck in the traffic. Uh, so I could not really grab um, the clear difference between uh, uh, orthogonal polynomial on the real line and then uh, the extension to the fractal. But my question is uh, as follows. Uh, you know that uh, oh, classical orthogonal polynomial on the real lines are structured like classical Orthogonal polynomials, where you will find those you have been mentioning, uh, uh, Legendre, uh, Laguerre, and so on. And then you have uh, semi-classical orthogonal polynomials, and you have uh, Laguerre hand class. This is on the real line, and this is connected to the properties of the measure used to define those polynomials. So my question is, is there yet any structure and any characterization of orthogonal polynomial on the fractals? That's the first question. And the second question is uh, about the possible differential equations satisfied by uh, such uh, polynomials. I've realized that the auxiliary polynomial is intimately connected also to the original polynomial so um i'm worrying if we already have some computer algebra software which uh, given some input can generate those uh, orthogonal polynomials thank you uh, thank you very much um i think uh, mama both are very interesting questions so the first thing I want to point out is uh, things like uh, emit polynomial. I don't even know how to sort of define them in this setting because one thing you have to realize is that uh, the Sipensky gasket is more or less like you, or you can view it as a unit interval. So it's uh, almost like an orthogonal polynomial on on interval here, not on the entire real line. And uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, our work on the, in this setting are probably one of the very few that have looked at uh, polynomial or orthogonal polynomial in this setting. And uh, the one that we define are exactly the analog of uh, of, uh, of a legend polynomial. So I, I don't uh, I don't know how how you'll go about to define over. We are trying to sort of do something similar uh, and. Uh, right now to define over polynomial, but uh, it's, uh, um, 
it, it, so it's it's not that easy to sort of uh, replicate some of these results. So this is like an interesting thing people can sort of look into if they want to. So um, it's a, it's wide open uh, to, to to my knowledge. Uh, as far as like computer algebra, yes, that's one of the beauty that of this. Uh, uh, most of these projects are done with undergraduate students who have built like over the year like a dictionary of code. And uh, most of these code are probably accessible online. At least the one that we used for, for the uh, legend polynomial uh, are online, and then you can actually sort of play with them. And uh, we actually build upon those to actually construct this new uh, legend, uh, Sobolev legend orthogonal polynomial. And, uh, and uh, the fact that we have this auxiliary polynomial, yes, that's how we were able to exploit what we already know to sort of uh, do this. Now, the computation in this thing, because there are many things that you're doing, right? So you have your orthogonal polynomial, but you also have like to approximate, because to compute a function of the Sipansky gasket, uh, you're taking a limiting process. So you're approximating that as well. So there's many levels of approximation involved here. And I believe despite all we've done and uh, some of the code that the student wrote, which are very good and run very fast, uh, I don't think we can sort of uh, do things like uh, when the degree of a polynomial gets too large. And by too large, I mean, I believe like uh, 20 will already sort of uh, be too much for the computation that we're looking at, because even looking at this on an approximation, 10 level approximation of a Sipansky gasket, that's already a lot. We're talking about something that sort of live on this level, that's a lot. So I think we're using mostly like a thing between approximation level between five and 10, for most of our numerical display. So this graph that I show you probably didn't use like a more than, a more than five, uh, between five and 10 uh, level of approximation. So yes, we have like some code. Um, uh, if you go to my website, you can get a link to the project that was done. And from there, you can sort of see some of the code for the original one. And if you want to play with them, you, you're very welcome. Okay, so thank you. I would like to get uh, the slide so that I can reread it carefully. And then sure. another part is that in my uh, research team, you know, I'm specialized on the corner polynomials, but uh, on uh, real line and some type of uh, multiple variable, um, we work on autocorner of the continued variable, autocorner of a discrete variable, and autocorner on a Q discrete variable. So the question is, do we have already some work on the discrete case or Q discrete case, or is still to come? No, it's still to come. Um, no. So the only thing that we've done is what I'm just sort of sharing with you here. Uh, yes, that's that's about it. We we're looking at other things that uh, that seem interesting, but uh, these are too early to sort of uh, sort of say anything about. So if if you're thinking about a different a way to sort of use this. I mean, I think the the number of questions that you can sort of tackle is uh, is infinite here. So, you know, uh, I can send you more about what we're doing, and then you can look at uh, whether or not they're sort of close to to what you're thinking about, and and look into those directions. But yes, um, you you can go for any kind of question here, and I'm almost sure that no one has sort of uh, delved into them so deeply. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to get material starting yes, with this I'll, slide. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, send the slide to Bubaka and to Samson, and then they can share it with you. And then you can email me. I can send you like the material if you want to. Thank you very much, Bubaka. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Pro. Um, any other question or comments? We already hit Hello? five o'clock here. Hello, yes. Professor Tasso. Yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'd like just to, yeah. So you are defining Legendre polynomial over a uh, fractal set. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, like your uh, Sprinsky triangle. Yes. Like in the uh, Legendre uh, uh, polynomial, they are coming from a differential equation. And they know yes. that Sprinsky triangle the dimension of uh, Sprinsky set is something logarithm, something, it's a real number. Is it yes. like you can find an equivalent differential fraction differential equation with this related to the dimension of the fractal set 
that can govern Legendre polynomial in over any fractal set. For example, if you have the dimension of fractal set is like, let me say D, which is a real number, I can find a fractional differential equation related to that dimension that can govern like like the same real like the same real differential equation but it's fractional and it depends on the fractional set that you want to calculate or find the polynomial that you are interested in this is first okay yeah yes. second yeah second equation uh, second question sorry so if we have like uh, uh, like in the real world we have fractional like uh, we don't have like smooth uh, or real dimensions uh, I mean integer dimensions we have real dimensions so we don't know the dimension exactly of any let me say mass or any any something right so can we the can we okay we uh, we can find like a dimension can we know even approximately the dimension of this set okay then and after that you can figure out like for example here the Legendre polynomial over this set i know it's difficult but maybe i can propose something can i define like the fractional der derivative as a sum or even an integral because it's uh, continuous from from like i don't know from zero to infinity or something and after that try to sample some some uh, uh, differential operators from this set such that i can approximate like to the reality or something i don't know maybe my second question is not clear if it is not clear i can reform it uh Okay, for the first one, uh, I think I, I understand the first one, and that's something that uh, uh, I, I don't know the answer to. That's going to be very nice in the sense that uh, uh, I can definitely write a differential equation that this uh, this uh, Legend polynomial will satisfy, but I don't think I don't think they are very natural, and uh, and so that that something we try to sort of look for but we couldn't find something that's going to be very natural to define it's possible that it has to involve like uh, the, the host of dimension of uh, of the Sipersky triangle uh, but uh, i'm not i'm not exactly sure so that that's an interesting question and uh, I, I don't know the answer to but you can sort of see when i look at uh, the sober level orthogonal polynomial in that case i'm able to actually and we haven't proved this yet but I think this second order differential equation should be like uh, the differential equation that need to govern like a uh, visible uh, orthogonal polynomial. Uh, we know they're satisfied and uh, we're trying to sort of prove that uh, this is uh, a complete way to generate them. If you can find the solution to this, then there must be like uh, what you're looking for. So that I think it's a little bit more promising. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is that in this setting, the Laplacian is not really like a, a second. So I've been sort of making the analogy between the Laplacian and the second derivative. It turns out that uh, the degree of the Laplacian in this case is really not like two. Uh, it's something else. Uh, I forgot the number exactly, but it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, a log of something over log two or log three. And therefore, uh, this could be like related to your second question. But uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how to how to answer your second question. It's, it's not completely clear to me how to do it, and um, and I don't know uh, I don't know what to say. Okay, thank you so much for your question. But can I like give uh, a proposition? Like for example, can I write? For example, we have like uh, I need to take the derivative. Uh, like of order alpha right then yes. i don't know whether alpha is like if i choose it uh, like as a real number can describe this fractal set or no can i for example oh, no. write can i so, write so, like yeah so can for, i write from like, from an harmonic analysis just give me a minute can i from an harmonic analysis point of view right to take a derivative, uh, you can do it in the Fourier domain by sort of multiplying and then take the inverse Fourier transform. And uh, in this particular case, you can do the same thing. So I can take like, uh, 
I can take I can use functional calculus to sort of uh, take like power of the Laplacian and uh, try to sort of uh, think about that as somehow like a, a, a differential operator. And so whatever the degree of a, of a, of a degree of, of a Laplacian is as a, as a, as an operator, then if you want to add a few more degree, you just have to sort of take the appropriate power. So that one I think you can easily do, but I'm not sure that's what you're asking for. Okay, I, I, I said like, can I make a sum? Like I take these operators with a degree alpha belongs to R and I take it as a, a, a space vector here and try to write the, the operator that I think that it is the real operator as, as a sum over these uh, operators, over this uh, derivative of degree alpha, where alpha belongs to R, I, let me say from zero to three. Okay, I, I don't right. know. Maybe, uh, maybe we can, maybe, can we maybe uh, look at this offline? We Do you want to send me an email and then we can discuss this? Okay, thank uh, you. If you want to sort of, I, I can send, put my email in the chat and then you can just email me and then we can discuss this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. I think uh, we should try to wrap up now. It has been a, a long session. We are really thankful to Professor Casso for this wonderful talk. And we thank you all for joining us. And we're planning the other one in a month's time. And this time we have uh, Raposo Bandera from U ETH Zurich, who is also going to give a talk. Uh, he will send an email about the title of the talk as the date uh, gets closer. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Casso. Thank you, you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Go back and right. uh, talk to you later. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye. Um,